Okay, right. So, as you know, we're here for two hours. The idea is that we have got two visiting professors, one of whom is a visiting professor at the University of Versailles and who is kindly accepted to join us. Uh, professor Kukatas, as you know, is here with us um, and is here to, to also uh, to share his experience. And today, uh, um, and his experience of his work, but today we are very lucky that they are both presenting a paper which was presented in September already uh, in Canada on um, I mean, what is their joint specialties, Hayek and Tondina. So we're very pleased to hear this. Obviously enough, we will be discussing what we've been studying in class because we have studied both Tondina and Hayek. So hopefully you will understand where I was coming from in insisting that Hayek should not be described as um, the person who, are, who he is often believed to be, and that there is another dimension to Hayek, which comes out in this paper, which is very important. So I think uh, it's, it's, it's very, very present that it's coming um, two weeks after uh, what we did on Hayek. The idea is that you've got 40, 45 minutes. Uh, then we'll have a number of questions. We'll see how it goes. Um, Please also feel free to ask a number of questions on Hayek and Tocqueville, but also if you wanted to, uh, to discuss other subjects which are related to the paper um, well, on the, what is essentially the idea of liberty, feel free to do so. We'll be finishing by 12 o'clock um, and I will be using this paper um, in, I mean, as a sort of background also for your exam. So the idea is that please do take notes uh, and please do focus on what is being said because the exam is next week, obviously now. Okay, so it's sort of recap before the exam the next week. Okay, have you got any questions before we start? No? Okay, I'd like to thank the, uh, the fifth year students for being with us. Hello, uh, well done. Uh, it's nice also having the first year students and we felt that um, perhaps we should do more things together. Uh, I, was, uh, I was told by Patrick that it was nice having the, the, the two years together and it's true that we didn't have the time. So before you leave, which is before next week, perhaps I might think about, I know it's already over. I know it feels odd. It goes very quickly. I just think, I know, I think about perhaps doing something if you're coming on the uh, workshop on populism. Uh, perhaps we'll see you on in the, it's Friday the 16th of December, Friday morning, you know, from 10 to 12, uh, we've got three postdocs working and presenting their work on uh, populism. Okay, without further ado, Christine and Chandra, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, well, again, thank you, uh, Catherine, for um, inviting me here in this occasion, inviting us uh, both. So, uh, as Catherine mentioned, this is a joint paper that we that we've written, and the reason for this coming about is that I've written a lot about Hayek, and Christine has written a lot about, uh, about Tocqueville, and it seemed like a useful collaboration for us to um, begin, because uh, I think there, and we thought there were things to say about both these thinkers that would be illuminating both about Tocqueville and about Hayek, but I think ultimately also about some questions that were important for, for both of them. Let me begin with a couple of quotations from uh, uh, Tokyo to um, set the scene for, I think, uh, the, the main thesis of the, uh, uh, of the paper that we've written and also the, of uh, the presentation we're going to make today. Um, in the first instance, it's uh, a sentence from uh, Tokyo that goes, Equality produces, in fact, two tendencies. One leads men directly to independence and to push them suddenly as far as anarchy. The other leads them by a longer, more secret, but surer road towards servitude. This is in uh, Democracy in America. Uh, the second quotation also from Democracy in America has Tocqueville saying, the nations of today cannot make conditions among them not to be equal, but it depends on them whether equality leads them to servitude or liberty, to enlightenment or barbarism, to prosperity or misery. So the point of starting with these quotations is simply to indicate that 
took those concerns were more than anything else about, about liberty. Christine will elaborate on this uh, in her part of the, of the presentation. But I want to set this up because the same thing is true of Fefe Hayes. That's evident in the titles of his, uh, of his work, Road to Serfdom, <laughs> Constitution of Liberty, Law, Legislation and Liberty. Liberty appears uh, throughout his writings. And this was his, his major concern. Um, and I again want to make this point clear because he's all too often regarded as someone who is primarily an economist whose concern was with utilitarian calculations about economic well-being, economic progress. It's not that he wasn't interested in these things, but as I'll try to suggest, uh, this was really subordinate to a much more substantial concern that he had with individual freedom. What we want to do in this presentation and in this, in this paper is explore the connections between Hayek and Tocqueville because firstly, Hayek, we think, drew inspiration from Tocqueville when it comes to his understanding of individual liberty. His understanding of liberty owes a lot to Tocqueville because he sees Tocqueville offering certain insights into the nature of liberty that are not really found elsewhere. Of course, Tocqueville is not the only source of Hayek's inspiration. Um, he draws, especially in the 19th century, from the Lord Acton, from John Stuart Mill, from Wilhelm von Humboldt. But Tocqueville really is, uh, in many ways, the touchstone of Hayek's thinking about freedom. And this is what I hope will will come out in the, uh, in, in the talk we're giving today. So in the first instance, let me say a little bit more about Hayek's thought and how liberty fits into this thinking. Uh, and then Christine will turn to an elaboration of Tocqueville's thought and pick up on some of these themes and see uh, how they actually really quite deeply embedded in, uh, in, in Tocqueville's thinking. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, Hayek's reputation comes to us primarily as that of the economist. He won the Nobel Prize in 1974. His earliest work was on trade cycle theory. Um, he was interested in very technical questions of economics. In the 1930s, he turned to a more political concern, but nonetheless, with a very much economic orientation. He became absorbed by the debates uh, initiated by Ludwig von Mises on the possibility of socialist calculation. This was uh, in the 1920s and 30s when the Bolsheviks had come to power in the Soviet Union. And the idea of a centrally planned economy was something economists took very seriously. Ludwig von Mises tried to show that economic calculation without a market society, without money, without free exchange, without private property, was simply a technical impossibility. Um, for the most part in the 1930s, this was not believed. Uh, it was some time before economists came around to this point of view. Hayek was instrumental in many of these debates because he deepened uh, Mises' critique of uh, central planning. But as I said, in the 1930s, he was still on the wrong side of the debate. Uh, and also, in a sense, in the, on the wrong side of the debate among economists on questions of macroeconomic policy, as he was very much a non-interventionist in, in economics, especially in the context of the Great Depression. This was an important source of tension or conflict and disagreement between him and John Maynard Keynes. But in all of these cases, he did not get involved in debates about questions of political philosophy. This all changed when the, when the Nazis came to power. Uh, this was the, the, the critical event for um, Hayek's intellectual development. <clears throat> because uh, having moved to London, taking the chair in, the 19, in 1933, he viewed the events in, in Europe uh, with alarm as he saw his native Austria absorbed into Germany and then ultimately the outbreak of war. He became very concerned about 
the extent to which the British public and more importantly, the British uh, uh, government fails to appreciate the threat posed by the rise of uh, uh, Hitler and Germany, not just to, uh, to Germany, but to, to Europe more broadly. And his concern now was not just that um, Germany might be victorious in war. His concern was that the entire German um, enterprise was founded on uh, something that was deeply inimical uh, to liberty. And even more importantly, he saw a parallel between um, the German aspiration under uh, Nazism and the Soviet aspiration under Stalinism um, as something that was deeply uh, troubling for the Western liberal tradition. It was a challenge because what it held up as an ideal was a kind of controlled society, a controlled economy. But what he also wanted to say more importantly was that you know, this control was going to come about um, not just to the disadvantage of all people and societies economically, it's not just that it would make societies poorer, although it surely would for all of the technical reasons that Mises, uh, uh, Ludwig von Mises had advanced, but because of the kind of society it would be necessary to create in order to sustain a planned economy. This, is, this was the thing that he, uh, he was really exercised by. And you can see it not only in his academic life, and you can see it in his practical activity in the 1930s. He wrote dozens of letters to the BBC, to the, to the, uh, to the UK government, to anyone who could find who would give him uh, um, a bit of time to say, you don't understand how serious this is. The BBC, in fact, tried to fob it off by saying, well, thank you, Professor Hyde, it's very nice of you to write. We'll get back to you. And he wrote back and he said, no, you, you, you don't understand. I'm going to make a complete nuisance of myself until you listen to what I have to say. In particular, you've got your propaganda against Germany all wrong. You know, your propaganda is ineffective. And it's ineffective because the Germans haven't been able to hear the truth about what's happening in their society. So it's critical that you make them aware of what's happening. And what's happening is that they're losing their freedom. They, they, they don't see that they're losing their freedom because it's happening in a way that's surreptitious, that's gradual, um, that's leaving them completely unaware of what is happening. Your job as propagandists is to make this clear to them. And so he kept going against the uh, um, you know, efforts of the BBC saying, this is what you've got to do. But there, there was a deeper intellectual uh, argument that lay behind uh, Hayek's thinking here. Again, it was not just that this form of social control would ultimately make their uh, economies poorer. His concern was that ultimately what it would necessitate if it was to even begin to work was a transformation of the societies that were going to be controlled, whether it's in the case of the Soviet Union or in the case of Germany, or for that matter, in the case of Britain and later on in the United States. Now, what was the concern here? The concern here was that in order to sustain the kind of uh, planned society or the controlled economy that Central planners um, were interested in, they would have to, in certain ways, also control the population. Now, Hayek was concerned about this in part because of the impact on Germany and um, the Soviet Union, but also because he thought that even as Britain was fighting against Germany, it had failed to notice that its own political system was enamored of the model of central planning. Their plan was, in fact, to become a planned society after the Soviet model once the war had been won. And Hayek, at this point, in the 1940s, decided 
that he wanted to show why this was a serious mistake. This is why he wrote um, his most famous work, The Road to Serpent, which came out in 1944. It was addressed to the socialists of all time, or dedicated to the socialists of all time, because he was uh, afraid that this particular model would become the norm, become fashionable, become entrenched in the countries of the developed uh, West, certainly of, uh, of Western Europe. Now, why was he concerned about this? Again, it was not just because he was worried that this would lead to um, economic impoverishment, although he thought this was the case. He was concerned about it because what he thought would happen is that firstly the plans would not work because any attempt to plan centrally would run up against the problem that people would not comply with the plans, partly because their own plans did not necessarily square with the, the plans of the planners, but also for, for very technical reasons that uh, if you're trying to plan a complex economy with millions of components, uh, each component of that economy, each individual, responds to local signals uh, as much as they do to central directors. And when these two things don't coordinate, people will figure out what's going to be to their best advantage and act accordingly. In order to stop them from doing this, central planning would have to be increasingly interventionist, increasingly um, intrusive in order to get people to comply with the plans. Now, this is bad enough given that it will lead to great inefficiencies, but ultimately what Hayek is concerned about was that in order to get these people to comply with the plans, central planners would have to intrude not only in certain economic decisions that people took, but they would actually have to start getting people to buy into the nature of the plan, to help them internalize the aims, the objectives, and the methods that the planners were putting forward trying to implement. What this would mean in the longer term is that the method of the planners would have to involve trying in a subtle way to change people's thinking, to get them to think in ways that were more compliant with the ends of the ambitions of governments or planners. And this is really the most important thing that Hayek thought he was trying to say. The goal of central organization will always involve an attempt to transform people's consciousness, because without that, they could not comply. Now, the problem with this is that ultimately, this is a form of limiting people's liberty, but in a way that's more insidious and troubling than the means simply of using force or violence or threats, because those might actually elicit a response. It might lead to objections, maybe even resistance. But this more subtle means was insidious because it threatened to overwhelm people without their actually knowing it, to bring them to not care about the loss of liberty. In the first instance, perhaps because they're not aware of it, but ultimately because they internalize the norms that are propounded by the authorities in their efforts to keep up with their plans. Now, in Hyde's subsequent work, he tried to extend this analysis to explain why this is possible at the deepest level throughout society, not just in the context of economic planning, but in the context of any effort um, to control society, even if that control is to be exercised in the name of democracy. Now, Hayek is sometimes presented as simply a, critique, a critic of, uh, of modern democracy, of uh, modern society, um, to the extent that society has moved in um, a direction that is unsympathetic 
to the idea of the welfare state. Now, this is, uh, I think, a mistaken reading of Hayek simply because he was, to the uh, dismay of a lot of his libertarian uh, readers, actually not unsympathetic to the idea of promoting institutions for the protection of uh, individual welfare. He thought that a wealthy society should be able to provide uh, at least a safety net um, for the poorest. And their society became wealthier, the quality of that net, that support should be should become naturally higher. He was not against uh, institutions that address questions of the environment, equity in housing, and a whole range of things. But he was worried that the attempt to control the process, um, if it went beyond uh, a certain level, would have the effect not only of being unsuccessful in the achievement of plans, but also enforcing authorities to try to manipulate the consciousness of the society to ensure greater and greater compliance with the plans. Ultimately, what he feared is that it would turn people into creatures who are much more dependent on institutions and authorities than they would be otherwise. What they would lose is that independence of spirit that was critical uh, for a free society. And why did he care about this? Well, ultimately, he cared about it for its own sake. And I think this, I think, is important to understand because I was often thought of as valuing liberty for purely instrumental reasons. Liberty is good because it makes us happier, it makes us healthier, it makes us richer, and so on. He thinks it does make us wealthier because a free economy will be more productive, but that is not the point. Ultimately, for him, freedom is valuable for its own sake. And I think this, in a way, brings us back to, um, to Tokyo. The, the title of uh, his most famous book, The Road to Serfdom, is inspired by passages in Tokyo, which Christine will talk about um, in a moment. But, but what I want to just finish by pointing out is how much for Hayek freedom is actually what's important for its own sake. Like Tokyo, he felt that freedom was something valuable and that had been underappreciated. Uh, so perhaps I'll let Christine pick up the uh, story at this point. Okay, let's see how I'm going to do this, having anticipated some sort of a program of not having brought in the iPad. So we're going to wing it here a little bit. Um, uh, well, let me see, I might like sort of turn a bit left. No, I can do it this way. We'll try. Um, let me follow up on what Chandler is saying. Uh, in, in a couple of ways, uh, first on the immediate point about the the intrinsic worth of liberty that someone like to do, and and the the ways in which liberty is both practice and law. Because here again, I think we see this very deep connection to Hayek, and we see that he's being very powerful in a way uh, I believe then has different, which is different than how it is quite commonly been understood. Um, liberty, as I'm sure you know, is without doubt the central value of the uh, He writes of it as his full passion, his greatest passion. He writes of its intrinsic worth as well, um, meaning that it is good for something in and of itself, independent of the many good things it brings to you. As you know, in democracy in America, one of his concerns about the pull that we feel for equality is that equality's charms are instantly visible to us with dangers less so. With liberty to reverse, it's true. We are less likely to understand its, it's more hidden charms, its more hidden attractions. Um, indeed, I would argue that liberty is the organizing principle of total thought. Uh, it is at the heart of democracy in America, a book which, despite the title, is neither really about democracy nor about America. Um, if you recall, democracy in America is, is used by Parker because it's in America that I can see the principle of equality most fully extend itself. I can see, if you will, the development of history in the American context. But that, if you recall, is not why he's interested in looking at America. 
his preoccupation, his interest in America, is because he believes there we can see in this innocent democracy what we have to hope and fear from it. And the political science he wishes to found from those observations of equality of conditions in America is one that will help make equality safe for liberty, that will protect it from the various dangers to liberty, which is specific to an age of equality. Now, given the importance of liberty in total spot, any definition, even any sustained discussion of it, is surprisingly elusive. Nowhere does he define liberty explicitly, nor does he offer any, any systematic um, discussion. He says at one point in the Austrian regime, please don't ask me to describe this sublime feeling, I cannot. Um, at times when he speaks of liberty, he speaks of it as if it were negative liberty, bringing in negative liberty, the freedom from constraint, right? He talks about it sometimes as pleasure of being able to speak, to act, to breathe without constraint under the government of God and the laws alone. Yet he also speaks of liberty as something highly individuated. Liberty itself has no telos, there is no direction to our human, ex to the human exercise of liberty. Instead, the ends, the purposes, the goals are things to be determined by each of us according to our own life. Um, I would argue that there is no communal aspect to Churchill in any meaningful way, but those dimensions of his thoughts of his associative life, which are often praised by communitarians, these exist, as I hope to sort of argue later on in this talk, in the service of protecting the individual of their efforts to be free. Um, in his most uh, extended description of liberty, though, Tocqueville draws a long comparison between freedom and commerce, which I want to quote quickly. So to be free, one must have the capacity to plan and persevere in a difficult undertaking. To be accustomed to act on one's own, to live in freedom, one must grow used to a life full of agitation, change, and danger. To keep alert the whole time with a restless eye on everything around. This is the price of freedom. This extended um, comparison of commerce, one of the things that I think it does so, it emphasizes that our capacity for being free, growing accustomed to being free, growing accustomed to plan to act, growing accustomed to depending on oneself in a life of danger. This is so important. Oh, it helps us see that liberty itself has a significant spiritual dimension. The individual who has been accustomed to living independently in the past is more likely and better able to live freely in the future. Um, so we can begin to see from these, these remarks on liberty that took were made. Some preliminary things about its character, right? It's theological, it's teleological, it's individuated, there's a significant habitual dimension to it. But again, he refrains from telling us anything more about the positive content of liberty. And so instead, if we want to know more about liberty, we have to look to his discussions of unfreedom or servitude. And indeed, as Chen has already indicated, it's via this language of servitude that the dialogue between Hayek and Tocqueville begins. In an 1848 parliamentary review, Tocqueville attacked socialism for its appeal to materialism, its attack on private property. His greatest complaint, however, is that socialism is opposed to, to individual liberty, that it has scorn for individual reasons and that it reveals a complete contempt for the individual. Mm -hmm. Total charges in that speech that in preferring that society be directed by a centralized authority, socialists want to substitute the will of the state for the individual. 
thereby constraining the scope of the individual liberty and making the state, in his language, the keeper and trainer of its citizens. So contends in that speech that socialism is properly understood, a new system of servitude. Now, many commentators on Hayek have read this, have assumed that the road to serfdom is drawn from this speech. And, and as Kendra said, it's not, you know, it's not a, a mistake that's unimaginable given the group of speech on socialism, given that Hayek is at the time, especially primarily an economist. Um, but a number of Tocqueville scholars as well have picked up this theory and believe that that the that Hayek's own preoccupation is with the sort of mechanics of socialism. And I want to draw attention to the fact that Hayek's familiarity with Tocqueville extends much beyond that 1848 speech on socialism. And that one of the threads that runs through both the road to serfdom and the constitution of liberty is democracy in America itself, which is quoted in both works. Um, and so I think that if we look a little bit more closely at Tocqueville's discussion in democracy in America of servitude, we'll be able to see a more amplified version of what Hayek is concerned about. Um, the discussions of servitude that take place in the 1835 volume of democracy in America are primarily concerned with the first volume, are primarily concerned with with slavery as it was practiced in the South and the US at that time. Um, and most of those references are, are you know, the legitimate, typically being held in, in bondage. But the thing that I want to draw attention to in those discussions is when Tupel writes about the way that slavery transforms the consciousness of society, he's writing about the difficulties of. Um, of integration and of uh, sort of more meaningful emancipation following abolition or in, in places in which slavery no longer exists in the north of the world. And there he says that having spent his life in chains, this has left the slave with only the habits and the thoughts of the slave. And that liberty is difficult without having been apprenticed in it, without having had the practice of liberty. And I'm going to leave this 1835 discussion of the internal transformation of servitude, of servitude's internal men, to the side for a minute as we look forward to volume two in 1840. Um, and obviously, servitude there appears most notably at the end of that last volume of Democracy in America, where Temple begins to discuss that new despotism, the kind that he cannot name, but that is specific to democracy. This is the famous false despotism, which operates in a manner different from previous despotism. Um, it is, as he describes it, detailed, regular, far-sighted, and mild. The way reason that it's mild is because it preserves bodily liberty. We as individuals within the blockade of solid state are free to do most of the things we wish we want to do. Indeed, all of the things we believe we wish we want to do. And yet, what we fail to recognize is that our desires have been shaped by the government itself. Coco emphasizes that it is this internal transformation which accounts for the mildness of this new form of despotism. Again, it preserves the appearance of individual choice while simultaneously hollowing out that choice itself, hollowing out the diversity of choices that we as individuals might make, some good, some bad, some pro the regime, some against the regime, until the content of choice is only that which has been endorsed, which is allowed by the state. He also details how the self-despotic state, how he says, 
um, to the world with a, a web of intricate, small, minute regulations that extend over all of society. What's happening here is that by regulating small aspects of our lives, the government accustoms us to being led, to being directed, to look somewhere outside of ourselves to understand what we should do and how we should exercise our so-called liberty. The government does keep its citizens with temporal problems theoretically based in childhood, right? This is the reason that this form of government is not permissible because it does not wish for us to mature into choice makers. It wants to make us into um, a herd, if you will, he likens us to, to a democratic herd being used to led by, used to being led by a benign shepherd. This is, as well says, a longer, more secret, but sure road to servitude. False despotism is indeed the perfection of servitude in that it achieves this transformation of consciousness, changing us from people who wish to direct our own lives into people who wish to be directed by someone else. This portrait of democratic despotism, I think, helps us to see, better understand um, two dimensions of servitude and by extension, two dimensions of liberty. The first is that servitude's psychological aspects are much more significant than its physical aspects. When Tocqueville associates liberty with action, he often does refer to it as the removal of barriers. More importantly, however, action requires the will to act, the will to act, the will to choose, the will to direct one's own life. And we see in the depiction of the psychology of democracy, how other aspects of democratic psychology further the erosion of our will to act for ourselves individualism in which the individual feels weak against the mass of society, leaves us less prepared to act for ourselves. Materialism um, makes us more prone to turn over direction of certain areas of our life to a central authority as long as we have the ends that we believe are most beneficial. And also the tyranny of the majority, I would argue, further the erosion of individual strength and capacity. Indeed, as we feel ourselves weakened against the central power, we are more prone to turn over our chosen capacity to that central authority. And when that central authority is a democratic central authority, we are also less skeptical of it because we cannot imagine that it would be um, interested in a person. That there are no firm class divisions, no difference in, in principle, in goals or in the end. Um, this habit, as we turn over more of our choice making powers and become accustomed to being led by others, this habit of being led erodes our own will to act. It slackens the motivating forces of the will in us, he says. And it transforms the individual into someone who prefers to be guided rather than someone who prefers to be active. In this way, he tells us, democracy, the tutelary government, prepares us for servitude. The citizens in the self-exotic regime become, and I will come back to that 1835 discussion of slavery, we become much more like people who have been held in bondage throughout our lives, who no longer understand how to exercise our freedom, 
we become the opposite of the self-motivated, self-governing New England township inhabitants that he admired in the beginning of democracy in America. Um, so if the sapping of our desires to act is one of the things that I think emerges out of this discussion of servitude. The second and related feature of liberty that we can see um, via the discussion of self-despotism is really that the practice, the practice and habits are required to strengthen that will in us. Um, here, I think we might think again of the, the features of local government that Tocqueville praises, of associative life that he praises. And it's important to recall that he praises these because they make us into self governing individuals. They make us people who wish to and who are capable of. Governing ourselves, exercising our liberty, and leading our own lives with Dury as well, right? All of these institutional features of liberty are in the service of cultivating character and personal traits within us and the will to be free. Um, liberty for total requires practice. And these habits of liberty that we that we can exercise via associative life, via jury service, via local politics, all of these will be essential for liberty and preservation. Um, we, through the practice of these civil civic forms of liberty, local forms of liberty, we come to value acting for ourselves, and we cultivate our capacities to act for ourselves. These, I think, are what he's after in trying to preserve both through the liberties, which again are, are fine, but they're not valuable for themselves. We can see in the praise of these, the desire to rehabilitate, to reignite, and to strengthen the, the sort of um, Brings of our independent will to liberty, which is what is most gravely at danger or endangered by the new forms of servitude. Okay, so <clears throat> we've given you uh, an account of bias thinking and uh, an account of uh, total thinking, how Hayek thought draws from. Uh, Talk to not being for, for inspiration, but actually for some uh, very, very specific arguments. I want to finish with uh, just a couple of, uh, of, of observations before opening up uh, the, um, <coughs> to, to discussion. And the first observation is about the, the road to serfdom, Hayek's uh, first important work. Um, he gets the title from Dr. Tocqueville talk talks about the road to servitude. Hayek talks about the road to servitude. He was initially going to call the book The Road to Servitude, but the title seemed very clumsy, and someone else suggested the road to serfdom. And so that's how it became the road to serfdom. But the original title was completely Tocquevillian. But another thing about this particular argument in uh, The Road to Serfdom is that Hayek is often read as trying to make uh, a kind of slippery slope argument. That once you go down the path uh, to central planning, uh, you will inevitably uh, end up um, at, a, <coughs> at, you know, at a particular conclusion. You inevitably end up uh, with complete tyranny or despotism. And people often look at societies where they are and say, well, look, there's plenty of central planning here, but they haven't gone all the way down to servitude, all the way down to despotism, all the way down to tyranny. Perhaps the whole slippery slope argument is not correct. Well, Hayek says quite explicitly, it's not a slippery slope argument. It's not saying that once you go down this path, there's an inevitability about it, because ultimately his concern is not 
about the destination, but really about the process. What happens to you if you get onto that road, if you go down that path, if you find yourself in a society in which there is um, planning of a certain kind, there's social control of a certain kind. What he wants to say is not that you'll end up somewhere, that way the, the metaphor to road is a bit misleading. What he wants to say is that if you're in that sort of a society, this is what's going to be happening to you. You will find yourself in a condition in which your freedom is gradually lost, lost um, to a greater and greater degree. It's not that this is not reversible, it's not that things can't change, um, but this is the condition that you will find yourself in. Now, the other question that surely should be asked is that, well, so what? How, how bad could that be? I think there are two kinds of uh, points that uh, might be made. I think one quite explicitly by uh, Hayek, and I think another I would like to add to the, uh, to the analysis. Um, the very Hayekian, and I think ultimately Tocquevillian point, is that if you allow this to happen, you will become a certain kind of person. Your, your fellows will become certain kind of, kinds of people. And this means becoming the sort of people who aren't jealous of their liberty, who don't mind being told what to do, who don't mind being controlled. Now, I don't want to overstate this because to some extent we're all controlled and perhaps necessarily so because we can't really imagine a society without any kind of uh, authority, without any kind of judgment, without any kind of law or process. We are to some extent necessarily government. It's hard to imagine what society would be like if there's simply no law, no government, no regulation, no limitation, if there were no cues. Life would not um, be feasible. So it's not something to be overstated. Clearly, we need to be um, in a society in which we are to some extent governed. But the, the question also remains, to what extent, how far um, are we to be governed? To what extent can we resist forms of government that are unduly intrusive and so on? I, and I think Tolkien's point is essentially, if you're not mindful, you could get to the point where you've lost much more liberty than is really warranted. And worst of all, you won't mind. But I think there's another aspect to this that I'd like to, uh, to, to draw out. And that, that's, this might be drawn out by referring to another French painter, uh, Michel Foucault, who I think is also very interested in this particular uh, this particular topic. Um, when he was interviewed in the 1970s by uh, a journalist who pointed out the, um, the existence of um, concentration camps in the Soviet Union um, in which uh, people were held as prisoners undergoing forced labor and so on. Um, the initial response of the Soviet authorities, as Jones mentioned, was um, to deny the existence of these camps, to deny the existence of the kinds of uh, uh, subordination and imprisonment that was there for essentially political prisoners. But eventually they couldn't deny any longer because there were cameras that had shown the images and so on. And at that point, what the authorities did was they turned the story around and say, oh, they, yes, those, those camps are there, but you know, they're um, in order to protect us from criminals. So this was the new narrative. And what Foucault observes is that of course, this is what they will do. They will do this. At first, they will deny it. But then what they will try to do is they'll try to normalize it. Yes, of course, it's there, but it's, it's necessary. And eventually, the population might be reassured that this is OK. Of course, people are being imprisoned. Of course, they're being denied various sorts of rights. Of course, um, there's not been a trial. But it was necessary because they were criminals. Um, and this is necessary for the authorities to, uh, uh, to engage in report elders because otherwise the whole system would simply 
not be sustainable. You need people to endorse this, to embrace this. And in a way, I think this is a point that I can talk to might have made a bit more strongly. That is that when your liberty is taken away from you, it's often taken away from you, not just by thought, but by getting you accustomed to it. But also necessary is for it to make it easy for you to be accustomed to the loss of liberty of your fellow citizens, your fellow human beings. Because most of us as social creatures probably find it harder to think of the suffering of people we're close to. Certainly there are many people who would sacrifice ourselves for. We care about our own freedom and well-being, but we also care about others. So any system that's going to try to limit your liberty is going to have to try not only to get you accustomed to your own loss of liberty, it's going to have to get you accustomed to the loss of liberty of others by giving you reason to internalize this, not just for yourself, but for the society as a whole. And we can see that you know, everywhere in societies where there has been oppression of one kind or another, you have to have a narrative that says, this is right, this is okay, get used to it, it will be fine. And I think this is really at the heart of the kind of argument that I want to make. This is why freedom is important, because having freedom makes us certain kinds of people. It makes us people who are not only jealous of our own freedom, but of the freedom of society more broadly. And I think this is an important insight, which is you know, worth grappling with and trying to bring out more clearly. And I think you know, working on Hayek and Tocqueville in this way is uh, just one way of trying to get at this particular point. I mean, I did like to say that um, this a such specialist so kind of the two subjects. So um, I think you know, the idea here is to open a discussion, perhaps we can feel that there are aspects that you didn't fully understand. Um, if not, of course, I can start with questions if you're comfortable. Or, but if somebody would like to start, I will give the floor. Feel free. Feel free, yes. No, no, no. Yes, Shay. So, um, so just again, each time present yourself, okay, right, perhaps, right. And, and say that you're a force of this, your students is always a good um, Hi, uh, my name is Shay. I'm, uh, I'm actually from Tunisia. So, um, so um, you both so eloquent, eloquently put it that uh, both uh, Hayek and Tokyo have emphasized the fact that um, freedom is sort of developed an instinctive uh, just, so to speak, over one's, not only one's liberty, but that of the others. Um, however, I felt maybe I misunderstood, but I felt that they, their conception of liberty that's actually constructed, so to speak, uh, maybe then was a little bit missed the point in the sense that they follow the assumption that it's not instinctive, that not that even under a system where liberty is uh, portrayed as submission, so to speak, so uh, sort of or else slavery is freedom, so to speak. Uh, there, there will always be the, the instinct of revolting, of refusing uh, that concept. Um, from my own experience, having lived the uh, 2011 revolution, all the, I think maybe their conception was more contextual, as it's more influenced by the politics of it, of the debates of the competition between the communist bloc and the uh, American capital, cap capitalist. Maybe even it's less about liberty and more about capitalism here. It's a very capitalistic conception of uh, liberty. So. Um, I think my bit, my question is to over is um, would Hayek and Tocqueville's great debate, so to speak, great questions about liberty, uh, be applicable in your opinion to a situation where um, you know 
a system like uh, Indonesia or today in Lebanon or even in Taiwan, because you know there are variables, you know, cultural variables and uh, even uh, migrational variables. Uh, but uh, I wanted to ask you what what's your like, what your take on a situation like this. Um, I don't think the kind of regime we're considering makes a difference to the, um, the core of the argument, but the, the way in which the, the question of, uh, of freedom would arise will be contextual in the sense that um, there are different sorts of concerns that might be important in, in different sorts of societies. So I don't, there's probably no least um, about uh, Tunisia, but thinking about um, somewhere like um, <clears throat> Taiwan, for example, or Lebanon, or Singapore, or the United Kingdom, places like I do know of it, then or Malaysia. Um, I can see that you know, there are different sorts of issues of, uh, of liberty that, that arise, and there are different degrees to which um, these societies uh, have liberties restricted, or um, in which the, the citizens are either um, controlled or manipulated or subject of uh, more subtle forms of control. It, it does vary you know, a, a, to a considerable degree. Um, whether it makes a difference, whether they're capitalist or not, is an interesting question because I think for both Hayek and Tokyo, um, it is going to be important that the institutions uh, of the society um, are capitalistic to the extent that um, limitations on freedom or social control extend um, um, everywhere, not just um, to private life, but also to economic activity. If you have a society in which, let's say, the idea was to leave people free in their personal life, but to control their economic um, activities through much more regulation. Which is a more, a more common, so to speak, interpretation of liberty. Yeah. As a, yeah. Um, I think they both worry that what you would get is a gradual diminution of liberty in all of these areas, because the problem is that if you've got to control people in one respect, you're going to have to control them in another. So again, I don't think it will make much difference which kind of a society that you're, uh, you're in. In all of these cases, it's possible for the uh, um, for the loss of liberty to, to come about. If it makes you maybe more knowledgeable about Tunisia, it's the very same logic on which uh, a police state, so to speak, like uh, the regime was based. There was always a saying: you, you were taught, even if you were five year old, is don't say anything about politics, and you will get like five, uh, like you'll get your salary, so to speak. Yeah. So sort of the as long as the economy is doing good, everything else you can take it away from us, uh, which is sort of the situation. So, so I mean, that, that's quite interesting, isn't it? Though, because it, it's one of those great examples. I mean, it, it's, it maps differently onto different parts of the of human life. Yeah. But someone like Tofim is basically saying, like, look, go enjoy yourself. Go have a happy life. Go have a good car. Go have a nice house. Have a good holiday. Hang out with your friends. Go to school. Do go do all those other things. As long as you're doing one of the hundred versions of that that are socially acceptable. But the minute you step beyond that, it's not okay. And the sense is that that there's something that's lost. I mean, you see in in Tokyo for all that he. Uh, in general, in democracy in America, individualism is a bad word, but he's clearly enamored of what Mill would later call individuality. So he clearly sees the you know the the significance of that. Um, and in, in terms of 
free market versus non-free market. I mean, neither neither thinker is really a super free marketer. I mean, not a socialist, but both for a pretty robust, you know, safety net for, for emergency situations. But they want to make sure that in all areas of life, um, particularly not, not always all because of religion, mm-hmm. but that, you know, that the maximum freedom that one can withstand is, is available to the individual. And so hence uh, the theorizing with which I would disagree that if, you know, where Topol says that if if everything is, is up in the air in politics and everything's up for grabs, then we have to serve in our in our in our religious spiritual world. It has to do with his own understanding of what kind of liberty we can bear. Can we sort of can most individuals withstand uh full, if you will, kind of existential liberty, or will that be overwhelming to them? And then they'll they'll too quickly probably give up too much liberty somewhere else. Did you actually provide the answer or was it an open sort of question? How much we can withstand? Yeah. Um, I mean, his thing on that is he says, you know, you have to serve either in the spiritual world or in the political world. If everything is going to be up for grabs, sort of, uh, you know, who are we, what is the universe, all these other things, then we're more likely not to be able to withstand complete self-determination in our in our in our in our political writ broadly world. Now I mean I think there's an interesting question you could kind of draw out from that on the basis of the analysis we've been putting forth today, which is could we become more capable of withstanding more freedom, meaning in both realms by practice. Um. Yeah, okay. Um, first, I still have it, Anthony. I still have it. Yeah, I mean that's that's the whole question, right? The the idea and that that's that important distinction between sort of parental authority, which hopes that at some day we learn to exercise liberty for ourselves, you know, gradually you're given you can stay out later, you can pick what food you eat, you can do whatever it is, but but the idea is that uh, the despotism that he sees on the horizon, and, and in which, you know, to be fair, we, I mean, we live in Singapore, which is soft despotism writ large, where you're told more and more what to do. And so then the possibility is how do you develop what, what I would describe as the sort of musculature of freedom? How do you develop those capacities when? all aspects, as you're saying, of life seem to point against that. I mean, Tophil would give, you know, some possibilities out there. He would talk about uh, uh, civil associations and, and about local involvement, you know, the ideas that that here you, you actually can make a difference and that bit by bit you develop the capacity, but you also, and this is significant in those discussions of civil association, you develop the taste for it. Right. So so if you think of just something as simple as as any voluntary organization, you know, you develop that. Ah, I did that feeling, you know, we accomplished something and that bit by bit that sort of takes away from uh, it, it. It shrinks your desire to be led and, and encourages the parts of you that would prefer to lead yourself.
Yeah, I mean, so so when you know when people uh, talk about democracy in America, one of the big issues is you know there are these sort of two dangers: there's tyranny of the majority in the first volume, and there's soft despotism. And in a way, your question brings out one of the ways in which they're related. What is the cost for you? of going against what society wants, whether it's society in its non-political forms or in its political forms. What is the price of non-conformity and its complete ostracization with all of, of the, the hardship that goes with that, the psychological, the physical, the emotional hardship that goes with it. And the same is true in some ways of trying to carve out a space to govern yourself in a society that doesn't want you to do that anymore. And so there, I think that's why Tokil is looking to the, the sort of sanctioned ways, the ways that the regime itself would sanction of volunteerism, of civil association, of local involvement. And, and he says, you know, um, somewhere in one of his notes, he says, the task of government, the first task of good government is to help its citizens do without it. And yet it's very difficult to imagine why any form of established power would want to cede that power, whether it's a social authority or whether it's a strictly political authority. Thank you, Steve. Uh, good morning. My name is Anthony Cameron. I'm from Lebanon. I am an astrophysicist student in political ideas in the digital age. Uh, my question is maybe about the book itself, Democracy in America. So when you read the book uh, as an analysis, you can see that of being mainly uses five key features to characterize the uh, American left or if you want, is the love of equality, two absence of tradition, three, even though you said it's a bad word, but individualism, four tyranny of the majority, and five importance of the association. If we feel what to look now back at the now at the US and where it stands and how it evolved in the past hundred years, because it evolved greatly, would you still use this five ten characteristics? We are falling alone, so we're not associative, as Robert Putnam would say. We are, what was the second one? Absence of tradition. Uh, absence of tradition. We have 200 years of tradition. Um, I, you might ask, I mean, I know that's not that much, but you might ask, what does, what does that tradition look like now, though? You know, tradition in what, right? If we have now a history of increasing centralization that that's maybe changed. The third is love of equality. No, the first is the love first was love of equality, which I would say is definitely still true, and particularly the way that Tokil parses it as the love of equality. You know, so why do we love equality more than liberty? Well, we love equality because we can see it and we can feel it instantly. We can feel that we are as equal to other people, and we may not understand the good things that come to us from being free. We might think because we're individualist, because we're materialistic, because we don't want to be bothered, that, that we gain a lot from ceding liberty. Um, but the, the other thing that he says that's really interesting, and I think even more true about love of equality, is that the way that it translates itself, the way that it issues, is often into a hatred of all inequalities, and particularly a leveling version of that, where we want to pull people down to be at our level. Um, so two things to note there. One, the sort of evil side of it, the pulling people down, that seems quite true, but also what is the dominant political cause in the democratic world? Inequality, right? Social inequalities. I mean, you know, this is, this is, and so I think he's captured something there. What are the other two? Uh, there's tyranny of the majority and the importance of the association and individualism. Uh, tyranny of the majority, yeah, definitely true. Especially, I think, in its softest form. I mean, the thing that, that is that you know the most interesting part of tyranny of the majority is, and it goes back to the sort of Hayat total take the transformation of consciousness. That I think I was trying to get a little bit in my response to you. If the price of going against the majority is that, as Topol says, you know, you are ostracized from all intercourse with your fellow citizens. You, you don't have a job, no one will talk to you. You know, you're just shut out of all of life. How does this change your thinking? How does it begin to transform what you will consider? What might be, oh, I don't want to do that because bad things will happen to me. And I think that that shrinking of our range is another, that's something that seems very, very true to me. I think I got them for you. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
Uh, I can see, yes, down, down, uh, okay, Patrick, after, please. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, um, I'm um, um, from Hungary, so we need to ask you for instance of emerging bureaucracy. And uh, hence my question. Uh, how do you, how would you think some talk real? How would you think talk real so you and solve the rest of this in the darn dwarf's idea of the place it's the years to change society? Um, and because arguably the way Germany and say Japan was democratized after the Second World War, after the, the, the terrible kind of uh, brainwashing that happened during the is out of the big there is 18 decades of US military presence there. In order to become, you know, as liberal and democratic as, as they are, and uh, you see the essence of it in you know, East Germany, it's very, really, very easy to see today still. So, um, how would you think that to talk about? How would you? But what would it be all take place in within a country system? It was not yeah. really about. I mean, I mean, so, the well, so there. I mean, the to me, the kind of Tocqueville point of contact, or at least one of them, would be the importance of moray. Right. I mean, that's what Tocqueville says. That's what we're when we've been talking today about a transformation of consciousness. It's a transformation of mores. And so, you know, you Tocqueville's line is, is as you know, always that mores influence how laws are going to be, you know, observed or, or implemented or any of those other things. But um, I think that we have some interesting cases that would prove the opposite, right? That law can change mores, that mores don't always change laws. And so the, the continued American presence after the Second World War, for example, in Japan, that's one example of using formal structures in different ways, whether it's a constitution, law itself made in the shape of other mores than the existing societal mores, where that law can change more as you see it in the US as well in the civil rights legislation in the 60s, 50s and 60s, sort of uh, judicial and legislative action. If you force people to sit side by side in the same schools, you actually can eventually impact, one would hope, uh, ideas of equality. So, so there is a place for law, I think. And I think that Tocqueville is you know, following Montesquieu, he somewhat overstates, though, the centrality of more. Is there places in the non-published text where he says, well, obviously, I know they work in the reverse way, too. Laws can, of course, influence mores, but what's the proportion? Um, the other, just to also tag on something about, about uh, places like Hungary, places like uh, the Trump US, I mean, you know, I mean, one of the worries that didn't come out quite so clearly in this talk, I almost interjected at the end, was um, the habit of being led, the, the lack of concern with freedom because life is okay, life is going well, I'm able to do the things I believe I want to do. A lack of concern with freedom as freedom is, Tocqueville says fairly quietly, but he says, you know, this soft despotism, will can prepare the way for real despotism that would be even worse because people don't want to resist at all. And so you can think about the ways in which, I mean, here I would say, you know, some of the uh, incursions upon freedom in America, because people can't, some people can't be roused to care about it because they don't, these things don't impact them directly. And so they've lost the kind of, commitment to to freedom in and of itself as long as so they're happy to be led as long as it's not impacting them. Therefore, the US is because compared to it is young in complacency, as you said, uh, with the situation, like um we never really see what it is like when it's completely missing. So obviously at some point we have to try it. Uh, so that it's awful. But for the Hungarian case, or the other it's only was maybe 30 years since the uh, regime change and this is kind of appetite for freedom for who kind of grows, but it updated and it had organic but also it kind of like uh, aspect with so that's why I want to be done. Yeah no how long would it take because other countries managed um I mean it's an interesting question there's, there's no sort of prescription to it. You know how how long does that take to feel rooted in in the society? How long does the transformation of mores take? I guess parts of it would would depend on what context you're coming out of and you know, so you could say, well, well, why, why have the experience of different post-communist countries been different? I, I honestly, I don't have a kind of answer to, to that, other than to to think at. I mean, uh, 
the clue to take from Tocqueville is is the examination of all aspects of society. You know, everything from historical particularities to uh, the place of religion to values, you know, how these have been mobilized in different moments by different societies. And when he's comparing, you know, when he's looking at democracy in America, he's, he's obviously speaking to a France that's in a very different historical moment that has very different institutional and social features. And he's not saying this is a blueprint, but he's sort of saying, you know, if what you want is to have equality that's consistent with liberty, then look at this portrait. Don't try and replicate it, but try and see which of these many variables could be mobilized. Many The, the many sort of domestic variables could be mobilized, which threaten it. It might be quite different than the American picture. And so if anything, I guess just the 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 Tocquevillian, you know, council be like, do that kind of 360 on society and see what emerges as reasons. But the other clue to take also as a first thinker, as what we've been discussing or looking again every single year, is the fact how demanding it is to be free. You want freedom. It's not something it's it's rewarding, but it's demanding. And uh easier to sit back and to perhaps think, oh, it's not that bad. Well, and it's easier to, I mean, you know, if you think about it, the sort of beauty of all of these more subtle forms of despotism is that they, we all believe we're free. You know, we're doing what we want to do. We're spending time with our family and friends. This is so much more important, you know, we're, because it's hard to understand why this is in our interest. And this is, I think, a part of that that self-interest well understood, right? To understand the things that that don't have immediate payoff, why they might nevertheless be, it's like wearing sunscreen or something, you know, like like I mean, you know, you don't think of it and then suddenly like should have been doing that my whole life. Like why would that be good for you? Moments of awareness to be the one you are talking about only happen at moment uh, instances of total economic breakdown. The moment the sort of life protection with sunscreen, so to speak, is no longer, you can no longer be denied even if you are. It's sort of when you start to go in and recognize that you are not against you. So I've got Patrick, then I've got Abraham, and Anas, and Asya. Yeah. And she was Okay. <laughs> Patrick. Uh, hi, my name is Patrick. I'm from Lebanon. Uh, I'm an uh, I'm a student. Uh, so my my question is basically a bit psychological. You discussed the psychological aspect of certainty. Uh, I'm going to quote uh, Jean Jacques Rousseau: uh, "Man is born free, but everywhere is he is in chains." Uh, do you think that freedom and liberty are constructive constructive illusions for the individual? And do you think that one of the tasks of breaking the chains is by creating meaning. It's an easy question. It's like, it's like it's like it's like it's like it's um, is uh, freedom an illusion? Um, a constructive, a constructive uh, uh, illusion as opposed to one that is um, um, that we're naturally inclined to uh, uh, to be mistaken about. So if it's a constructive illusion, then the question is who's doing the, um, the constructing. Um, I, I don't see any particular agent out there who is um, interested in creating that illusion other than in the sense that um, <clears throat> they have subjects who already value freedom and now they want to deceive them into believing they've already got it so that they don't um, um, start demanding it. So that's the only sense in which I can uh, think that freedom is, uh, is, an, is an illusion that's, that's constructive. There, there is another question, of course, as to whether freedom is an illusion, which is a larger metaphysical question, and that is really about the ultimate nature of our reality. Uh, and I'm not sure I have anything either interesting or original to say about that question. 
But on the on the on the former, I, I think in a way what Hayek and Tocqueville and others or included have tried to warn against is um, people or authorities or institutions that are trying to deceive you into thinking got something which you've actually already lost, or in some cases never really properly um, acquired. That's an easy question. But I, think, I mean, the other thing you can think of is whether freedom is, is an illusion that we possess, right? An internal salutary illusion. Um, and there, I mean, we're obviously free, well, I mean, aside from metaphysical debates that we can't weigh into now, because um, then the question would be, is it better, I think, to overstate or understate your freedom? If it's your own illusion, which is which would be more salutary for you? And and I it seems to me that overstating it, that to believe that you're capable of greater freedom than you might actually be capable of would be the helpful way, because that would encourage uh striving, right? You'd always be kind of trying to press the limits of what's actually possible. Mm. Um <laughs> on my uh, on the Abraham. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Ibrahim. I'm a Nigerian. I'm an student. So, um, why, did we, why was this need to, uh, to, to, to conversation? I was trying to sort of like picture how my country, you know, fits into the ideas that you were trying to explain. And so, I get to. Um, so, since freedom is, is um, one of the fund fundamental characteristics of, of democracy, um, and then it is somewhat a popular opinion that democracy is best practiced in, uh, in an enlightened society. Um, my question is um, Do you think that does uh, Tom Bill or Hayek give us any sort of um, an understanding of how societies that are less enlightened with like, high levels of literacy, how they can be? Because you need to know that you have rights before you can, you know. Um, speak up for those fight for those freedoms or for those rights. Um, does Hayek or Tobil offer any sort of like uh, way in which those sort of societies can you know, put themselves out of situations or they can fight for for rights? Um, well, I mean, it's it's Certainly in the highest case, I suspect in Dr. case, they also, they're already assuming that the societies in question do have a certain uh, level of um, you know, understanding of <clears throat> the, the way the world around each other works, the way in which um, they are prohibited or prevented from action. Um, I don't think it's the case that they would um, say that you needed, say, for example, a certain level of literacy or a certain level of knowledge of uh, your your constitutional rights. Although there are others who do think this, John Rawls, for example, thinks it's essential that people be taught about their their constitutional responsibility. Maybe that makes sense in a society where. You've already got constitutional structures that are you know, especially important, but there may be there may be other societies you can imagine where um, there are many communities, for example, which are relatively independent of central authority that are uh, you know autonomous. I mean, if you think about people in remote parts of New Guinea or parts of Indonesia, where their contact with uh, central government may be very limited. I think they could still feel the, um, the loss of liberty if there was intrusion into their way of life, um, but not because they um, have been denied constitutional rights of which they are aware, because those rights may not matter to them. You know, they may be just living in a kind of uh, uh, existence where it's irrelevant to them. Um, 
But I think if people are in a world where those constitutional rights are very important and they recognize them, then I think it's also going to be important that um, you know, they understand whether or not they're being limited, whether they're being restricted, whether they're being denied things that they're entitled to and so on. And there, I think, where you know, Dr. Lentai could be concerned is if you had a society in which um, institutions try to deceive people about these things, it wouldn't matter for some societies if they're relatively remote, but it would, I think it would matter for others. Yeah, I, I think that, that's right, probably. Speaking that Tuckle, you know, for all that when he looks at America, he's looking at a, I mean, he's looking at New England, highly, highly literate society um, with a, a long tradition going back before Magna Carta to, to you know, entrenched rights that develop in different ways. But um, those differences notwithstanding, I think it's at the, the local level that, that the the action happens, um, meaning not just that that's where society is governed, but that's where people learn about being free and learn uh, a, a kind of practice of rights, which is independent from a formal articulation of them. Mutual respect, wise use of liberty, as it was one of the ways he describes it too, the ways in which liberty and responsibility go together, um, um, the need to limit one's own liberty in order to have that mutual respect. So I think that, that that would be the kind of key place to look, independent of whatever formal structures do and don't do. Uh, okay, after this, and not this, I've got, so Anna, Asya, Shirin, Joanna, and then, and who this, in 20 minutes. We can do it, Anna. Uh, Sure. So my question is, um, I was reading a few weeks ago in your book written by a French, uh, French sociologist, um, he is in Montaigne, and um, he was reading a book about Foucault, uh, to each his own neoliberalism. So in this book, there was a section or chapter talking about security and liberty. And in this section, he defined liberal self. I will coach him in this uh, right now. So he said that in liberalism, freedom and liberty have has to be understood in two distinct ways. The first one is an ideological lie, and second is a technique to govern the human. And we add that the real and corporal liberty. So do you think that the rule of liberalism or the other rule of populism or liberalism, religion or economy really both of them both of them lead to servitude, one is obvious and one is insidious, or is it that the spontaneous order like Hayek was saying? Yeah. <laughs> um, so obviously a, a lot here turns on uh, the definition or the understanding of uh, of liberalism. So in this case, I, I think I just simply I disagree with the uh, with the quotation, um, speaking as uh, someone who regards himself as a as a good liberal. Um, but I. I think I, I, I you know, have a sense of why it, it is that sometimes people associate uh, or define liberalism in this way, even though for me, um, what's at the core of, uh, of liberalism is exactly the reverse. It's the repudiation of this, uh, is this, this outcome. But the problem is that it's not difficult to find uh, liberal societies which also exhibit a range of pathologies, including the, the ones that I mentioned in that quotation. It's not difficult, for example, to find a country like the United States with a history of slavery. It's not difficult to find a country like the United Kingdom, which has a long uh, history of empire in which it's subordinated uh, other peoples. 
So the, the question is, do we think of those, you know, um, examples, slavery and colonialism, as betrayals of liberalism, or do we see them as exemplifications of the book? After all, it's a liberal society, self-professed in some cases, and it's got colonialism or it's got slavery. So, you know, how do you disentangle these two things? I want to say that uh, what we have here is a betrayal of the idea in societies that nonetheless have also strong commitments to these things. What it suggests is actually how difficult it is to achieve this. Um, equally, I would say that, you know, with respect to some of the alternatives uh, that are often presented to liberalism, whether it's socialism or some other um, uh, doctrine, one could, one could do the same thing. One could say, well, look at, you know, here's a socialist society in the Soviet Union or modern uh, Russia. What are its pathologies? Does that therefore tell us what's the problem with socialism? Uh, you could make that, that argument as well, and I think socialists would give the same reply that I've just given. Thanks for that for that to myself. Um, I have some curious secondary students. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got Asya again, but Asya, I will I will put you down the list for others to uh, to uh, so for Shirin first, and then Luana, and then to me back to Asya. Uh, at uh, some point, you talked about uh, how liberty is what you think of the conflict of the election and the custom uh, to move on as a concerning body, mostly for the government's programs for its uh, goals and purposes. My question here is that why, the how, in what ways this kind of society can come to an understanding that something has been taken away from them? Uh, that uh, they are living like a leading like a, a leading a different kind of life. I'm mostly uh, talking about uh, like totalitarian government like North Korea, mostly because they have shut uh, all the possible windows uh, to the outside world. How do these people get an alternative notion about their, uh, what they are living right now? Uh, is that even possible for them, or uh, are they aware of this situation? <laughs> I, I think that. Um... The, the case of North Korea is is sort of actually a more it's an easier case except for the communication shutdown, right? These are people who are not leading good lives. They're not materially well off. They're in great poverty. There's all sorts of other suffering. Medical care is bad. So if you could break that, then people understand, you know, people would see the benefit of another any possibility, right? Any option is better than that. So there the question I think you're getting at is the kind of information and security trapping. But, but the question is, is all the more challenging the other kinds of despotisms where we are, you know, fat, happy and lead good lives and are, are much less free than we could be. And there, I think the question is, how do you make anyone recognize the value of something whose value they don't see? If they understand that as a secondary value, if what I care about, and this is why I'm most concerned about individualism and materialism, you know, my bank account's good. When individuals are, I'm not just alone, I get to spend time with my family and friends. It's not great. I have this time to do the things I care about. But how do I come to understand that I should, that I do actually have other concerns and that I should be preoccupied or at least occupied with things other than these immediate goals. I think that's a, a deeper and much more complicated question, especially once the tide begins to turn and we, we lead lives in which the exercise of our own freedom is, is more constricted. How do we understand the value of something we no longer practice and may no longer be capable of practicing? Yeah, which is the best in our race. Sorry, yeah, very, yeah, yeah. <laughs> very, very openly. Yes. Um, Luana. Luana, I think I'm a Brazil and I'm a black Swedish teacher. It's like, that it's a happy and why would you want to change that? Like, why would the authors or you, if you have an answer to it? What would total liberty look like? 
what would it offer to us that would potentially make us uh, aspire for more liberty? We are already happy in providing us food in our houses. Why stop them so dangerous in the sense? And why, what could it offer us more to aspire us to change? And more than that, how do we share that knowledge to other people? Because we might get to a conclusion here. How do we convince the others, uh, people who don't have access to Google questions, for example, that they might be more employing the language? I mean, I guess one way to begin to answer that question is, you know, for, for both of those thinkers, and and I would agree with this, um, a meaningful, an essential part of being human is a meaningful self-direction, right? At least the capacity for that. Now, it doesn't mean that we all lead self-directed lives, because we know that our choices are shaped by a variety of, of, of other factors, some of which we willingly acquiesce, acquiesce to and would over and over and over again, eyes open, and others to which we acquiesce, acquiesce less willingly or less with, with less knowledge. Um, I mean, uh, I guess the simplest way to think of it is, is in the two analogies that are in operation in that chapter, in those two chapters in Democracy in America. Are we children or are we sheep, right? I mean, you know, is there, and if, and if your answer is no, I'm not, this suggests that there is some value to making your own choices, even if you fail miserably, even if your life turns out horribly. Um, I mean, I think that Mill gives obviously a much more clear articulation of the, the, the sort of benefits of liberty, not the benefits, that sounds wrong, but of the, the value, the centrality of liberty than someone like Tocqueville does, but it's, it's there and that's where, you know, that's one of Mill's sources as well. Um, but the extent to which the one's instinctive answer to either of those questions is no, I think is, is telling in that it suggests that an essential part of being human is this capacity for liberty. And then to sort of build on to your second part, well, how do we understand whether we're exercising this or not? Um, you know, there, I guess it's a, a question of trying to equip yourself with internal research to discuss that question. But if you're already in my little soft despotism cocoon, how do you acquire those internal resources? Yeah, it's kind of different to uh, uh, Einstein from that. Um, I think it's quite possible for people to say, actually, I don't care about freedom because I'd rather have um, the things that um, are going to be supplied to me that will make me, make me happy. And maybe there is a trade off between fear and happiness, and some people will simply say, you know, I. I I'd rather have a quiet life. Um, but I think it's perfectly possible, and maybe even quite likely for uh, people who you know undergone great poverty, for example, at which point they would say, look, you know, if you're going to give me you know, um, comfort and security, I'll take that. Okay? And even if you say to me, look, you're going to lose a lot of freedom, I'll take it, because then I've got you know, I've endured so much already. That seems like a great deal. And I, I find it hard to say to someone that you're making the wrong, you know, you're, you're making the wrong choice. On the other hand, what I would also <clears throat> like to uh, stress is that we need to consider what kind of society you would need to have to produce that kind of um, security and happiness. Um, it can only be done by restricting people's um, freedom. Uh, I think to do that, what you have to do is what I mentioned before, uh, have a society in which not only is the freedom of those people who prefer that option but to be diminished just in favor of uh, company security, but you'll also have to limit the freedom of others who may not be willing to give it up because 
you know, it's not as if you can simply say, well, no, no freedom for you, but freedom for you because you want freedom and you want security. No, it's, it's going to be an all or nothing package. So that means that those people who choose the comfort have to say, yeah, I don't mind if you, you know, interfere with the freedom of those people and they're unhappy. I'm going to prefer my happiness, not just to my loss of freedom, but my happiness to their happiness and their loss of freedom. Well, if you're willing to say that, if, um, if you can say it, I think it makes you a less good person. And that's what I say to those people. Um, certainly you know, not an irrational um, choice, but it's a morally questionable one. And I would put it you know, quite plainly in those terms. They want to fight for freedom. But this went together with the Supernatural Project. Sorry for interrupting, but English is still so well. But uh, the government says that it's like why it's like it's, uh, have this uh, peace for nowadays. And let's see how it goes. So that, that is exactly what I said. People do not want to fight uh, because of somebody else wants to be free. Because Syrianity is very often so that was it. <laughs> this question is a very important because on top of it all, we just stay in charge with God. Katya from Georgia, and we've got out of Ukraine, and we've got a, a number of students coming from a number of countries in which these questions are essential. But I think it goes back to a number of things we've been discussing. What is the meaning of good life? And do you think the person would care? If so, if you said, and you're a bad person, yeah, they may not care. That, yeah, that's what I was wondering. Yeah. They may not care, yeah. right? Yeah. So, if, if uh, I think some of them might, you know, some of them might be disturbed. Right? Some of you know, if that be a race, yeah. some will say, Yeah, whatever. Okay. Well, or some and might say, some I like say No, 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 I'm not a bad person. Uh, and I say, Well, yeah, you kind of are. <laughs> um, hang on, uh, on the list, I've got. I know that Anthony, I guess what you're going to say is going to fit in also. In the, in. Yeah, um, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Raphael. I'm sorry, Raphael, I'm actually sorry. Um, what I want to ask, um, uh, just like you said, I was kind of worried because. Uh, Talk, uh, talk to you and I get kind of different ideas about uh, this positive and you know, in the government or in the society. I was kind of worried that uh, what can be alternated um, in the face of this positive? According to them, we are in your democracy and fairness, we are kind of saying that uh, whenever the citizens or whenever the people notice that uh, there is a uh, positive addition, um, we should be worried about what means that we put up. I'm going to ask, I want to ask, did they kind of um, give any suggestion on how to go about uh, to challenge this discussion of legal revolution or any other argument? For the face of the uh, of the opposed agreements, did they make any or they give any side of the approach to take by this? Because it's only about being worried. Are there steps, practical steps, to achieve a better society and exclude the rights of the I think a bit what I maybe to say something more about top roads. Um, I actually was very much you need to, you know, in society um, try to change people's thinking through rational persuasion by making arguments, by reaching out to others through, you know, his writings. Um, he thought this was extremely important. So he dedicated most of his life to exactly that strategy. He admired uh, the socialists for having um, done exactly that, but for, for socialism, for having it, you know, by, by having made it um, an ideal that people would, would do. He thought that you know, the thing that had to be done was for people like himself and others of like mind to go out and, and argue. Now, it's, maybe it's uh, slightly optimistic 
view because uh, um, you know, it's relying on rational persuasion, but that's, I think, what, what he genuinely thought. Yeah, but Tocqueville, I mean, he's, he's writing this, you know, about a despot of meat glimpses. He says this is sort of on the horizon and it might happen. Um, and and so he's not combating a thing that is fully blown and, and formed and in practice yet, unlike I think for, for Hayek in many ways. Uh, but he also, less as a public intellectual than through the act of of what he's writing wants to draw attention to the danger. And then he does provide within the work itself, within Democracy in America, a number of ways in which Americans have tried to do this. But the, the implication is, you know, other countries, France, look to your own resources. You don't have the same setup. But what types of things do you have? And primarily, uh, he's interested in local association, secondary powers, ways that individuals can get involved and understand that it's in their interest to be active participants in the makings of their lives. Thank you very much. Okay, we've, it's nearly 12 o'clock. I'm just going to ask a question to Chandra that perhaps you didn't dare ask him. Chandra, you knew Hayek. You met him at the end of his life. Can you, can you tell us a bit more about what's happened then, Eos? Um, <laughs> you know, we, we, I think I met him on, uh, actually, on three occasions. <clears throat> One, um, first time was uh, uh, all, all when I was a PhD student at Oxford. He um, <clears throat> was uh, the guest of honor at a, at a dinner. Uh, I didn't speak him at all, but he said one thing that really impressed me, which is that uh, uh, he was <coughs> the subject of a toast by the Hayek. He got up to he was fond to the toast, and you could see he was a bit tired of all the toast, because it obviously happened to him a lot. And he just said, you know, thank you very much. The only thing I want to say is that I hope that there will, there will never be Hayek in the world. But, you know, Marxists were always much worse than Marx, and Keynes was always much worse than Keynes. And he said the worst thing that could happen to me is that we create my idea. So I thought, okay, that's a very good uh, way to think about it. I next met him to interview him about his thought, about because I was writing my thesis on him. Uh, and um, it was a quite nice uh, conversation, but. Uh, um, you know, I don't recall much of the detail of that. And then on the third occasion, um, he wrote to uh, Isaac, because I think he's one of the founding members of the Hyde Society in Oxford. And uh, he heard about us and wanted to meet. So we agreed to take him to dinner. We took him to dinner at the Ritz in uh, London. Really? Gosh. We wrote to the Institute for Humane Studies to say, it is for students who can't afford to take five out of the nine week tickets somewhere better. So they sent us four hundred dollars for a seminar. We took five of us to apply to the uh to the He was in his you know, mid-80s by by now. So quite largely looking by cat back to the students for child. Uh you know, he was very charming. He you know remember recollected a lot of things about the you know, about his friendship with Kane, about his experience in the First World War, um, about the various presidents he met. Um, he said that he, he met uh, Kennedy. He said, Hello, Professor Hyatt, I'm pleased to meet you. I've read all your works. You know, but, you know, I don't think it's a pure theory of capital. <laughs> that would be too much for anybody. Uh, even I haven't read it. So. Uh, but he said he met Ronald Reagan. I was saying, my I read, uh, I read you know, the road to surfing and maybe think professional. I think he also met Albert Hoover. Uh, I think he may have met uh, the uh, uh, So he had a lot of you know, uh, things to say, but I, I couldn't so, say much about the man himself. I, you know, I'm sorry to interrupt, but he, he um, was interested really well about the fact that he met SDR. Um, I mean, did you have any, like an opinion about the PR policy of the New Deal and his acknowledge? Then he was on quite you know, brief uh, yeah. conversations. And, uh, uh, but he was a great admirer of Keynes. I mean, yeah. I said, he said this in French as well, that he was the greatest man in the United States. 
would be isolated and this would be a tragedy for German civilization. So you wanted to create a society where you know, the scholars in Europe would come together. Um, some would not because they were against the Germans being invited, but uh, the high purpose was quite different. And then, you know, he also wanted to, in a sense, you know, form a broad coalition of people from all sides of the political spectrum to combat the, you know, the ideas of totalitarianism. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think he, he really thought it would serve his purpose, you know, 60 years ago. Mm, yeah, um, but he could have lived in the United States. That's because that was a very good meeting. <laughs> yeah. You were there? Yeah. Last year? Right, well, thank you very much. I think uh, we had a um, wonderful time. Thank you very soon. Um, uh, I'm the site. So you won't be bothered, but I'll be there from I mean, there's something about that time which can arrive around nine. Okay, right. See you then. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.